guess where I focus? America only. Uh, so keeping that in mind, I have no foreign investors of any kind. Um, we only focus on Ameri not just American investments, but building America up in sustainable growth. So every community that we are in, we actively, we're not there to do one deal. We're there to do multiple deals in multiple ways to create that sustainable growth. So we're lifting not just our single family properties. We have an entire single family division. We have that, we have a multifamily renovation business. So I still buy multifamily apartments. We've got them all across the country. We renovate them, we still do value add, all of that. Everything we do is workforce housing. I don't do custom, I don't do affordable housing. I do workforce. The difference there, workforce means it is based on the median income for that area. Okay, so if the, if the average worker is 60,000, he can afford 1,500 a month. That's the wheelhouse we're playing in. Okay, same thing on um, any of our flips. So most of our flips actually don't even go to retail customers. Most of our flips go to tenants of ours that are on other properties or the 501c3s that we already work with. So we work with the Rental Housing Association and a lot of the local landlord groups, YWCA, different ones like this, and um, help them rewrite some of their programs so that they have a little more bite to them. And in doing so, we get more landlords involved. And again, now we're, what we're doing, we're building that sustainable growth. And because of that, any tenant that's been in any of our properties for 12 months, they can go through our financial literacy program. They can learn how to get qualified. We can help them get qualified. Then once they're qualified, we literally will go out and find a house that they can put sweat equity in, like a Habitat for Humanity concept. And then we actually make it so that they can get into that house. So they're already pre-approved in essence, we've got everything, they just have to put in the sweat equity. And obviously, if they don't, then we just sell it, no big deal. But, so that's what the most of ours, never hit the listings, never do any of that. So on the multifamily side, we also have our build to rent. And then I do my coaching business just for fun, just because I enjoy it. Build to rent is what we're gonna actually talk about. Who actually knows what build to rent is? One person, kind of. Oh, wow, bunch of newbies. Okay, we're gonna start at the beginning. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. This is me. This is who I am. 27 years. I have been in this 27 years, specifically in this specific Northwest market. So we literally started from the ground up. My husband was a groundskeeper on our very first property. Um, I was on the other side of things on the property management piece. So in doing so. We have literally worked our way all the way up. At one point, we had over 5,000 doors here in Washington State, all under renovation or brand new builds. So we built a lot of the North End, Snohomish County, um, Northern King County, a lot of those uh, we were a part of. So some of the big name builders and developers, we worked with them. So we, we know we, we've been on a full cycle on a lot of things. So that's where our background is. Our background is multifamily. The only reason I went to single family is because my husband's mindset was still a little small. So what happened was, in his mind, if Bethany fails, I'm gonna be on the hook for whatever that mortgage is, so uh, you need to do single family, because I can afford, maybe, maybe we can work out another $300,000 house, that's what his plan was. So I either did a phenomenal job showing him how hard single family was and the numbers don't really make sense, or it only took him one, and he said, why are we doing single family again? So we, we, we strictly do single family, um, we we're very picky about what we do, but we wholesale. So if, there, if there's something you're looking for, a place, a specific market, certain product, let us know. We also have an executive rental business, as Max referred to. Our executive rental business is across the country, and we do focus, our average tenants are there three weeks to three months. So we focus on a specific demographic. Um, we're not going for the vacationers. Shortest stay would be a week, but most of them don't usually do that because we have a lot of insurance claim people. We have a lot of military, we have a lot of traveling professionals, workers, IT, all of that. So our units usually are full with those kinds of folks. So different breed, but again, the one feeds the other. When you set up a business, which the way we set up American Made Home Solutions, our single family funded all of our payrolls, okay? So that funds the next year's payroll. Anything excess goes into multifamily. Our executive rentals funds operations. Anything excess goes to multifamily. Insurance and pattern. Multifamily builds out our legacy. Not just our legacy. My plan is to, um, and it would have been this year, had you not had a couple things happen and we had to pivot, but my plan is to get to where I'm not working any more than 10 hours a week in any of the businesses. At this point, I only have um, five businesses, and I, that's scaled back, I have eight. So um, I've done a lot. So lots of background, lots of experience. So don't hesitate to reach out. But that's who I am, and we are 100% remote. When 2020 happened, I'm still traveling all across the country to all of my projects and different properties, 
and what do we know happened in 2020, right? Everything kind of got shut down and it started dictating to us. And I don't really do well with that. So consequently, I actually had a medical card. Most people don't know this, I actually have a lung tumor. My doctor flat out said, Bethany, you cannot wear a mask. It will cause it to grow faster. I'm gonna give you a no. So I actually had a medical card. I never wore a mask. I flew all across the country, never wearing a mask, all the airports, nothing, never wore one. October of that year, pilot left to seat and was physically going to eject me. My husband looked over at me and he said, honey, I'm never gonna ask you again. Nobody on that plane cared that my life was in danger. Not one, except for my husband. And that's why I said, I'll never ask you again. Please put your mask on. And then this, literally, as soon as we landed, he was looking for the RV. And we've been 100% remote ever since. Uh, today, my flight back today was literally like only my second time having to be back on a plane. So I'm traveling all the time and man, my Florida team needs me every winter. But my Pacific Northwest team needs me every summer. So it's a benefit, it's a plan, and it is intentional. So <laughs> that is me. I do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, that's my husband. We've been married 31 years by the grace of God. Trust me, it is the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, we do. I do a lot of different um, meetings and, and events and things and, and whatnot. But I come from a very large family. There's 13 children in my family. So um, Jerry Springer times 10, basically what my family looks like. There's a lot of this younger generation doesn't want to own the house, but they'll have rentals. But they'll rent where they want to live. They're very intentional about that. So we're building a product that's very desirable. You guys have probably have never even heard of shotgun style house. Have you ever heard of that? It's an old west saying. So your house is literally like a big rectangle You'd stand at the front door, you could draw and get the guy at the back of the house. That's why it's called the shotgun style. Apparently that was a big deal and we needed that for safety reasons. That's all I know. <laughs> but with that being said, we can streamline things. So when COVID happened and we started having supply issues and things like this, our builder literally re-engineered the trusses and things to use less lumber. Some of our lumber that, I mean, you saw the prices, they went through the roofs, right? We were figuring, okay, how are we gonna do this? What we're we gonna do? Well, conveniently, he's right off the port. He saw all those ships that couldn't dock. He called a few of his buddies and said, hey, if we got someone out there, would you let us unload that? Sure thing, we got a whole bunch of lumber at a lot of discount. Because it was cheaper for them to offload it to us than it was to keep sitting there. So there's always a way, right? We just had to figure that out and make that work. And it's gonna look different, but that's okay, we were willing to. Now, we're doing some more amazing things and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit further. So this is actually 241 units. This one is in Broussard, Louisiana, which is a suburb. Now, we're always in where the growth is going. So this is a secondary market. Lafayette is the main MSA there and Broussard is the secondary market. All of the growth is going out this way. We're, why do you think we would be in a secondary market instead of where the growth is necessary? No thoughts, y'all are asleep. Appreciation. No, actually, no, actually, it has more to do with when you stop and think about a development project. How much time? How much time does it take? 18, 24 months. Eighteen to twenty-four months. In eighteen to twenty-four months, how much growth has moved out in that marketplace? How many jobs have now come into this area? There's a housing crisis all across this country. It's already there. The inner city, those urban rents are the highest around. People are leaving affordable housing, they're moving out, they're moving out, they're moving out. So if we're in that path of progress, when we're done, we're prime, right? Now we can get those top market rents and we can command the rent for that area because now we're the class A product, okay? So that's the difference there. So in this case, this is one of those um, projects that the city came to us. They literally had a building moratorium they saw what we did in Lafayette, and remember this is a suburb, so of course those city council people talk, and they knew they had a whole bunch of growth coming. What you guys may not understand is that the state dictates where the growth is going. So like in Arlington, almost 10 years ago now, the state dictated you need to have 20,000 units in your township, so to speak, otherwise you lose all your funding. They had to figure out how they were gonna do that. So. They have the same problem. They were told by the state they need to have all these units, number of units, and they needed to figure out how to do that. They already saw what we were doing in Lafayette. They came to us. 
but they had a building moratorium in place. They lifted the moratorium, approved our project, and immediately put the moratorium back in place. Right? That's how bad they wanted us. Why? They called even me. The difference between a multifamily where it's a hundred building, a hundred unit building, you have to wait for that whole building to be done before you get that certificate of occupancy. No tenants can go in until that happens. That's almost the end of the project. Where we're building these, the moment one house is done, I get it rented. A lot of times the cities will do things in stages. So it allows more flexibility. It also allows us to cash flow a little faster than a typical construction one does. So as you can see, the, the rectangles, that's all the, the different units. This particular one, we're actually doing in three phases. So our very first one, again, we have a lot of experience behind us. We built in contingencies. We individually platted those. So if something happened and we needed capital, we could sell off a couple of the houses. That was, again, we're in COVID. We're thinking ahead, right? This, on this particular project, we couldn't get them to let us individually do it, so we got them to agree to three separate sections. Again, so if anything happened and we needed to, we could sell off different parts or pieces. We could do different things. If we don't decide we don't want to sell to a hedge fund group, which is usually who's buying this kind of stuff, if we don't want to do that, in our situation, we're a Christian organization. We want to stay in these projects. Our very first one will sell. This one we're probably not going to sell. And um, our, our second one, which is actually in Mobile, Alabama, um, that one we will probably, we go back and forth every week. Are we selling or we're not? Are we selling or we're not? Are we selling or we're not? We can be that picky. There's so many other cities that need this in such a very large scale fashion. I don't have time to mess with that. It's like, kind of like King County and Pierce. I ain't got time for that, right? I don't want to deal with that. I don't want the stress. I don't want, you can be picky about it. So that's what we're doing is we're being picky about it. Um, but I'm not the only person, right? That was my team. You get to see it. That's obviously, it's all guys. I am the girl. I'm it. There's only one. <laughs> so this is actually our 160 unit. Foley, Alabama is a suburb of Mobile, Alabama. This one um, is, they forced ours to be a PUD. So it's all one. They intentionally forced that because this is right next to, has anybody heard of OWA? It's like a massive water park. That, like, think of Disneyland for water parks, kind of like that. They're building, intentionally building that city a certain way in the growth, so that's why they demanded that we have to do this all as one. So consequently, when they came back to us and said, oh, now, you need to build a fire truck turnaround lane, we said, uh, no. They're like, oh, no, yeah, you, no. You already made me do a PUD. I'm not doing it. So then, well, what do you want, right? Now we get some give and take. Now we start getting some other things done. So consequently, um, our electrical here is, um, I always say this wrong, and Chris always gets on me. So Chris, if you're listening, <laughs> um, when you're building infrastructure, you know, you're building out your sewer lines and then connecting to the main one, when you're building out your electrical lines, the city, when you're tapping into their lines, they charge you X dollars per foot. So everybody else is paying like $200 per foot we conveniently found an old law in the books that they previously overridden for people. We just made them enforce it for us. So we paid $5 per oh. Give and take, right? Give and take. Working together. We're solving a problem. We're doing something different. We also do regular multifamily, right? Just regular value add, um, class BC projects. We still do all of that because there's still a need. What we do isn't always able to be done in every single market. Is it necessary? Yes, but if I said I'm gonna do this up here, what would you immediately say? How can I afford to do it? Right, the cost to build is outrageous up here. Between labor costs, between land costs, between supplies, all it's just outrageous. So the only way we can do it up here is if we streamline a few things, which is exactly what we're doing. So the thing that we're actually addressing and the reason we're addressing it this way is for economies of scale. Those of you that are in single family, once you learn about multifamily, it's like you wanna go all in because you know the compounding effect that it has. So the same thing is true. If it's too expensive to build, how can I streamline it? I start going bigger. Not go smaller, I go bigger. So for instance, the flight that I just came back on from Kansas City was with a bunch of our partners that we've got there 
We are literally in the next two years, we'll have over 2,500 units built just in that market alone. How are we doing that? We literally are vertically integrating every aspect of that. So we went out and bought an electrician's business. We went out and bought a plumber's business. We went out and bought a lumber mill. We're building our own modular plant. We're gonna be doing panelized walls. Now we can get 50 houses up in two weeks as opposed to four months. That's how you do it faster and smarter. But it's still stick built code. We're not talking about manufactured housing. We're talking about good code that the lenders like, that everybody likes, but streamlining it. When you do it that way, now you can solve a real problem like the housing crisis. When the government is publishing this, and that's in 2021, it's only worse now. If you look any of it up, it's unbelievable. Here's the HUD's statement in their infrastructure strategy. You literally can look this up. If you actually read it, you're like, say what? And you, you pass this, and you, but nobody reads it. People don't pay attention. So when you actually read this and you realize, well, that ain't gonna work. So if we as a private sector are finding a solution that we know works, this isn't necessarily gonna go by the wayside, but when it's not working, now the government's gonna be looking for solutions. And now they're coming to us. So now things are getting done and lenders are changing a few things because all that money's been sitting on the sidelines, right? All year long, it's been sitting. You're gonna start seeing it flooding the market real quick. So in here, you all know who Warren Buffett is. What is he known for? What specific asset class? <laughs> Real estate, yes, but specifically asset class wise, manufactured houses. Most people didn't know that. He owns a ton of mobile home parks. Why mobile home parks? Quick, affordability, what is he doing? He's meeting the need of the people in a very quick fashion. Their cash flow, right? He owns all the land, right? I mean, he's like the best of both worlds. So he likes that. It makes sense to him. Guess who just joined the Build to Rent movement? No Problem way. Problem is, he was, it's like, and I can't even say it. It's like he was dumb. I can't even say that because I'm like, why would he do that? I haven't figured out his marketing strategy behind it because he partnered with Dr. Horton. Anybody have ever walked into DR Horton home? Yeah. Yeah. Did he buy some Pulte too? Yes. Yeah, I think he. What? So he he bought shares in this company. So he waited till. Yep. Till builders. Were yep. In I think he's gonna be he's because very, yeah. DR Horton is literally banned in some states. They have so many class action suits to get them against yeah. them. I think he's absorbing. Remember, I said I'm the buying gym. the electrical companies. Yeah. Right. I think he's absorbing those companies, getting enough stock and shares, and then. He's going to put it all under, under the Berkshire Hathaway umbrella, right? Yeah. He definitely bought the dip. He's not done. Yeah. So it's like, nah, I can't say he's done. There's something else at play I'm not quite thinking through here, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it tells you it is the next thing. And there's a reason why you're meeting the need and it's getting done. Now, if you're not the one building it, I'm not the builder. Derek cringes every time I talk. He's like, Bethany, no, no, it's not like that. And I, I remind him, in Bethany's world, there's rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> My guys can walk out there with a crowbar and they can lift up that slab and it's all good. And he's like, you, you just drive me crazy. And it's because I only need to know 60%. If I know 61%, someone's probably fired. There's no reason for them to be there, right? So consequently, I'm really bad with how things weigh. I'm really bad with how long things take. Well, Derek, why do we still not have streets in? Come on, Derek, what's going on? Only to find out the process to build a street is ridiculously long. In my mind, it was a two-step process. You pack the dirt, you throw the concrete or asphalt down. How hard is that? Now I've since learned there's soil conditioning. You have to, it's gotta have the right moisture content if it's not right, because you guys don't know what rain is here. And, and you're like, what? no, really, you really don't know. If you actually look up average rainfall, most of the South, gets more rainfall than we get in Washington. So in one rainstorm, what we get in three months, they'll get in one rainstorm. So when he's telling me, Bethany, the crews had to pull off in the rain, I'm like, dude, get an umbrella, come on. <laughs> it's a different, he's sending me pictures, everything is flooded. Now the moisture content is wrong. Now they have to wait for it to dry out. And then when they have back to back systems and blah, 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 right? <laughs> so he's the expert there. 
doesn't mean I'm not going to give them crap and make them go faster, <laughs> right? I'm still going to, but I also know that he has enough experience. So when we're going into the next season and we're in the wrong phase, and I'm like, whoa, 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 we're walking into hurricane season, rain season, what is, what's our workaround? What are we going to do, right? So that's why I have experts with me, but I'm not the one building it. They let me on the equipment every once in a while until it gets broke and then it's done. So, <laughs> so, many of the time people don't stop and realize if you can solve a little problem, you feed your family. If you can solve a big problem, you feed a whole bunch more families. So we went after a big problem because I don't know where you all came from. I didn't come from middle class America. My family was what they call the poverty level. So it was always hard to find housing. It was always hard to find housing that was affordable. It was always hard to find, if it was affordable, it was usually a piece of crap, right? It was usually terrible. So every time I get another property from a slum landlord and that baby is right next to black mold on the walls and there's a river running through it because the foundation is cracked and they're, they're bringing a vacuum to them, tell them to suck it up. It's like, I know that I'm making a difference. And when those hard days come and it's 2 a.m. and I fired the eighth contractor and I'm bawling my eyes out, I just try to start picturing those families <laughs> and get back up dust myself off because the hard times come, right? Just like anything. You have to learn how to mitigate the risk, but you have to understand why you're doing something. So we're trying to address a big problem in a very real way and make a profit at the same time because what we do with our profits, every single project that we do, there's a give back. So for instance, in one of our projects in Greenville, Texas, we have a, a minimum of 10%. Sometimes it's higher, depends on the area and what we're doing. We have a minimum of 10% that's a give back. So whatever that area's need is, this particular area that had a high abortion rate. So we partnered with Cities for Life. When we partnered with them, we became a line item on their budget. Now they got $400,000 they didn't have to go raise. They could do the job they're actually there to do. Now we're helping them, we're helping our community, and it's gonna keep coming back and coming around. So when you do that, and you're working hand in hand to, to accomplish that, that's the benefit of having connections. Right? You might know of a need that's in your area. Bethany, I'm not really sure, but I think there's a way. I feel like there's something here. We did this up in Skagit and Snohomish County, which those are the ones I prefer. Um, and what we did there is not just the nonprofits, but the local housing authorities. Everybody has one. Every county has one. They have a waiting list a mile long. If you have rentals that you're trying to get filled, find a way to come to the table with them. Why are they a mile long? Oh, because there's no landlords. Okay, if I could bring you 100 landlords, what would that mean to you? Oh, my word, that would be great. Oh, good, can we rethink that contract? All of the contracts got rewritten up there for any of the projects that we were involved with. Because again, we had to find a workaround for Washington state laws that were empowering the tenants to be destructive and not pay rents and live rent free for years on end and hurting the landlords. We had to find that workaround, right? So that's what we're doing, is we're just continuing to go and reach out to each of our communities only where it makes sense. I'm not doing it in downtown Seattle. It doesn't make sense for downtown Seattle yet. Now that we're doing all of our vertical integrations, where's the growth going? Not necessarily in downtown Seattle, right? But where the growth is going, if we're purchasing the, those lands and we know, and Terry's going, hey Bethany, I got this parcel of land here. I think it would work really good for build to rent. We've already streamlined all of our panelized walls. We've already got everything set up. We can build that up fast enough that we can efficiently do it here. We can get the land at a decent enough price. We can keep the numbers where they need to be. Because the whole point is if our investors don't make money, we're not making any money. We don't get paid unless our investors get paid. We intentionally do that. So as we continue to do and move out, the government knows they have to allow for more supply. The problem is that they pull all the permits across the country and they actually count that number. The deficit is so huge right now, it's just unbelievable. We're talking millions of units. So if we can do it faster with the build to rent concept, if we're doing single family homes, we can get those tenants in there faster. Every part of it, they like better. So the difference here is you have residential code, you have multifamily code. We're creating, in some places, new code which works for our benefit. 
Because now, what are we doing? We're solving a problem, but we're getting things done the way we want them done, right? So there's, at that point, we continue to scale it out, and it continues to grow, and there's sustainability. You can't just look at a piece of land and go, oh, I could put 50 homes on here. This is great. Not if nobody moves there. Not if nobody wants to live there. Not if there's no jobs, right? We are diving deep into all of these markets. But some of the quickest, easiest ways, where's the Starbucks at? Where's the Walmart at? Where's the Home Depot at? They have massive research and development markets out there. When they do this, they spend all the money doing all the work. If they're there, I'm good. It's a slam dunk almost at that point. If I can buy it right and do everything right, and I can still have to make mistakes, because I'm gonna make mistakes, we do, right? We still learn, it's still every aspect of it. So, we, it's not gonna work everywhere but we hone in on where it does. So for instance, in Washington State, I don't like landlording here. So when I had to spend too much time in court and the judge is like, Bethany, why am I seeing you again? You know, and I'm like, you're right, I know. So we sold all of our inventory in Washington. We reinvested in all those markets because every market's in a different cycle. Markets are cyclical, everyone's in a different place. So when we're struggling, struggling, struggling because the market's up here, and we reinvest in our markets that are down here, or their trough isn't as big. A lot of our other markets, it just doesn't have the big, we don't get the major appreciation, but in my world, appreciation is just bonus. I don't really count on the appreciation, that's all bonus. If everything pencils without the appreciation, life is still good, right? I, I, I don't wanna wait 80 years to finally uh, receive that appreciation, right? So, in this case, could empty downtown office buildings. We've seen them. They're everywhere. Downtown Seattle looks totally different now than it ever used to. But all across the country, there's massive amounts of empty office buildings. One particular building in Orlando, Florida has been empty 25 years. 25 years! It's unbelievable. Why would someone keep paying taxes on that thing? It's totally empty. It can actually, again, the right project, can be converted to multifamily. And then you create this urban and these lofts and all these really cool things, and we're already doing that. So our built-to-rent model only works in certain places, but we're also doing office conversions. We're also looking at, right, which markets can we get actual multifamily. Some of the multifamily that's older product still has land you can build on. And a lot of the areas, like um, in Snohomish County, and I think to Pierce has it as well now, they have a terrier zone. Do they have the flex zoning down here? Yep. yep. So you could quickly capitalize on what you thought was just a flip, and now you're making a whole lot more money because now it's a fourplex. And, and how you design it, and that's why you see a lot of those kind of tall, skinny things and that whole concept. That's why. It's for that, that reason. Investing. How do you guys actually invest? Some of you guys don't even know what a syndication is. A syndication is simply the government's term for pooling investor money. That's all it is. You can do it on anything. Most people don't even actually realize your 401k. Kind of a syndication. The difference there is they call it a mutual fund. Did you hear the word fund? Fund is a syndication. So what happens there is they pool all the money. They have to follow the same rules and regulations that I have to follow. We have four different attorneys on every single deal. Those attorneys are watching everything. The bank's attorney is watching us. Our attorney is watching us. It's, it's unbelievable how many people are watching this thing. But the PPM, the private placement memorandum that comes out that you guys have to sign if you invest, is 85 pages long. Most of you won't read it. I know that. I'm not stupid. Nobody wants to read it, and most people don't like the fine print. So one of the things that we have done, because we're reading them so often, we know what to look for. So we're looking for key things that can hurt you or benefit you. How many of you guys have heard of people that are invested in multifamily that they're doing cash calls right now. Couple. So what that means is if you're invested in a multifamily project and they basically run out of money, they're gonna do a capital call. When they do this capital call, all the investors have to pony up however much money they need. If they don't, their shares are gonna be diluted and now they're gonna have to bring in another investor to pony that up. So the way it works on a syndication, everybody, if you all own the property, usually it's a management team and then there's the investors. You all own 100% of the property. This team, the GP team may only own 30%. You, as the all, if this whole group invested together, you guys would own 70%. But then however much money of that 70% that you put in is your share. 
So just like a company when you go buy stock, it's the same kind of thing. The only difference is these are backed by real estate. Everything we do is backed by real estate. It's insured just the same. So everybody always asks, we're in Florida. What happens when the hurricanes hit? I don't even cry. That's what insurance is for. It's not a big deal. I actually, some of our deals that we get, the great thing about them is I can pull up the hail records. This was documented, guys, believe it or not. I can pull up the hail records, and if there was a hail storm, I can actually get the seller to file a claim on his insurance policy, not mine, and then I can actually get their insurance to pay for the, all the roofs to be repaired. Now I just saved a whole bucket load of money when I'm buying that property. These are little ways and tricks that we're able to do things, and well, as well as subject to, right now, if we can keep their loan and we can assume it, it's a lot cheaper. Not everybody is willing to do it. And that's usually because people don't understand. They don't understand the process, they don't know how, right? We've been doing this a long time. When my partner Andy talks, he's, he's a finance guy, he's literally a finance major. It's all numbers and everybody feels stupid when he's done talking because he's, <laughs> he's just one of those genius guys, right? So he's the one running all the numbers in his head faster than most of us are even thinking. And then he's like, oh no, the growth curve is blah, 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 you know, that stuff. When he's looking at something, he's looking at it through his lens. I'm looking at it through the lens of the community as the actual tenants and residents, and then the greater community that it's in. We are developing communities that people want to live on. How do we do that? How are they impacted? What do they want? What do they don't want? The average tenant stays 18 months. We are already getting the 24 month consistently because we're putting something called a community resource officer on site. The best way to possibly describe that is a missionary. We are literally putting somebody there with a um, Christian mindset that they are to be the hands and feet of Jesus, of us as the owners, to our residents. So if there's veterans who need to get counseling and they don't even know where to start, they're helping to provide, they're literally bringing those resources to them. If there's a shut-in, some elderly people, they're helping them get to doctor's appointments. If there's um, a single mom, they're helping, some of our sites we're actually gonna put daycare on, things like this. So these community resource officers are literally in all of our communities. They're living there rent free at our cost to be there for those tenants. Because if the tenant wants to live there and they feel like it's a community, it will continue to grow, right? And these are single family houses. People don't necessarily want to. So we have a lot of revenue streams that we can come in. We're building in um, obviously storage. Um, a lot of the, like those ones there didn't have garages. Some of them will have garages. Um, but we are adding a, um, an option where they can have a small storage unit on site. Uh, we already allow for pets. A lot of them have yards. We actually put yards in for them. This is absolutely free. Um, if you scan that code, it's um, we literally created an ebook just about built rent. So if you want to share this concept, you want to talk about it, you want to get better understanding, you want to absorb it later when you're not tired, um, this is how you do it. So any questions that you guys can think of Right now, besides Stems. Dylan. I got a lot of them. That That's okay. That sounds really a, a big organization. I'm, what's your team look like? How many people? Oh my God, I don't even count. Okay. I literally don't. Um, people well, always on the ask active that. side, like the GP side. Yeah. Because it's different for every single one. So on the build to rent, right now our GP team is four. Because of what we just did in Kansas City, it just blew up. So our Kansas City division, it's a whole lot bigger. There's, um, there's only there's still only four main GPs, but what we're doing is all these like the electrician business that we bought, the plumbing business that we bought, the um, excavation businesses that we bought. We are incorporating all of those owners, and we're setting up a fund just for them, so that they will actively be involved as well. So they will have a vested interest, and instead of them just going to work and showing up and getting a job, they're going to now finally build out a retirement because they never knew how to do it before. And we're going to teach them how to do it. How did you meet your partners? I'm curious. Um, it depends on which ones. Um, I'm very, very picky because I've been burned, right? Um, so different ones, my built to rent partners, we have worked together for years. Um, we are part of a Christian mastermind group. What's it called? Kingdom REI. Okay. And founded almost four years ago now. Um, and I was the first girl. Nice. So I literally turned him down. 
I told get involved with that, by the Yeah, way. it's an amazing group. Now, the reason every year in your business, I would always encourage you to be actively getting educated in something. I'm 27 years in the business, and I still to this day, every single year, I'm in some kind of mastermind. Because you always want to be learning and growing, and you don't know what you don't know. So getting around other people allows for that. In this case, as a Christian who's actively trying to do something, I need to be around other like-minded people that thought that same way. And then in doing so, next thing you know, God started showing us, wait a minute, he's working in a different, oh, wait, oh. So the actual motto or theme of the group is one connection away. So that entire build to rent model came from us in a, a planning session when we're sitting here talking and, you know, we all were having to write out what we believe the vision is that God gave us. And then we come back and we're reading it. All four of our partners were like, what's her all strangely similar? <laughs> <laughs> we might need to talk about this. But then along the way, we've done some different things. So what we've learned is iron sharpeneth iron, but it's not always fun, right? So sometimes you have to know who the right people are that are on your bus, that they're in the right seats. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going out and developing, right? I'm not stepping on Derek and Chris's feet. I'm out of their way until they're not getting things done, and then I'm in their face. But on the other side of it, they're not dealing with the community stuff that I am. They're not dealing with the politicians. They're not dealing with the local 501c3s. They're not doing any of that, right? So we each have our lane, and we define those. So if something happens and we lose money, we can still look at each other across the table and still be friends. And that's happened. And you have to be able to create so your contract is the bad guy, not your partner when things go south. Because just like a marriage, the number one cause of divorce, finance and stress, you're going to have it in any business relationship. You got to mitigate that. So that's what we do. So we met on, um, I built to rent guy in my Kansas City division, met a broker in Kansas City, knew them. That broker connected with another new member of our Kingdom REI. That Kingdom REI person reached out to me on LinkedIn. He wasn't a part of our group yet. Reached out to me on LinkedIn. Um, hey, Bethany, I see some of the stuff you're doing. I'd love to get on a call with you. We started talking. Sure enough, I'm like, you really need to be part of our group. You need to come and you need to see what we're doing and he joined our group. And in doing so, him and I have figured out we have a lot of synergy together. And uh, he's, in a lot of ways, he's kind of taken things to a different level. He's the guy that works like for Sheila Packard and he's like the strategic planner. Right? He's like super uber efficient and Excel spreadsheets he does in seconds and formulas and you know all the stuff that I don't do. I can't figure out stupid Instagram, right? That's what he does and he does super, super well. So when the possibility came up in Kansas City and, and I was explaining to him what we're doing, he didn't join us on any of our other build to rent. But he knew he wanted to do something with us and he wasn't quite sure how it was going to look and all that. So when he was calling brokers, because he knew, Bethany, I want you in Kansas City. And I'm like, you need to find a way to make it work. He, called, he was calling a bunch of brokers. This broker said, oh, you guys like build for rent. I know somebody. Then that person made the connection. One conversation away. Yeah. Is this uh, Kingdom REI with Ellis and it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I was part of his like original cohort. You were the so original was, cohort. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lee. How many different places are you located or have you branched out to? How many different markets? Yeah. Well, again, How many states? How many stuff. markets? The reason I don't count this stuff is because things change, right? Just like at one point we had 5,000 doors and then you sell stuff. Right? It's like, why do I need to know or keep track of any of that? If, if God is doing what he wants to do, I don't need to know that number. Um, we are in, it's easier for me to say states. Okay. So we're in Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kansas, Arkansas, Oklahoma and Iowa, obviously Washington, and the property manager that just called, that's Indiana. Oh my goodness. It's almost like the song. Oh, like the, the office to multi counties, uh, Ohio. Oh my heavens. <laughs> yeah. so, again, different things in different markets, different ways, different things. So I have literally I have too many deals. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, I, I literally get hundred to two hundred emails a day. It's a lot to try to get through. If you have a particular market that is not here, okay? <laughs> See that? Not here. If you have a particular market that you are interested in, like I'm going to Chattanooga, right? Reach out to me. 
because I will definitely, if you're looking for stuff there, I will connect those dots for you. I will bring them to you, I will show you, I will help make those connections for you. It's always easier if you can start somewhere, right? Not just randomly, okay, I'm here, now what? So I will help make those connections. So if that's you and you're looking and you like to go and you want to go to some other markets, reach out to me and I will help you with that. Have those deals been run through any sort of filter at all or is it just yes. raw? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. for instance, the difference is I have a reverse marketing strategy and you all should learn this. So my reverse marketing strategy that I did years ago was not buy into what everybody else said. So everybody else said on the multifamily side, oh, you got all the brokers, you got to stay in front of base, you got to keep them remembering you, da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like way too much work now, I don't do any of that. So instead, I got to know all the property managers. I'm going to have to hire a property manager for the property anyway. So if I get to know the property managers, they're always the first person to know usually if what property is going to sell or if it's in trouble. So then literally just Friday, and I'm getting on the phone tomorrow with the seller, I have 126 units coming to us from a property manager. That, that wouldn't have happened. That property manager is from Forty, moved to Indiana. So now he's like, oh, okay, Bethany, which one of these do you want? Literally. And that's kind of, so understanding and recognizing, in the same token when you said, is how many of these are vested? Get on everybody's list. Stop discriminating. Get on everybody's list. Sign up for everybody's newsletters. Do all of it. You're going to figure out who the good wholesalers are, who are not. All the ones that are bad, those deals fall through constantly. Go behind them and pick them up when they fall out of contract. Because they will. That was, that was how I got the most, almost all of my flips for the first three years. So we have all that in there. and We've got a strong board going of, okay, which one's good, which one's bad. Oh, this came from that one. Red flag. Put down the closing date, the whole thing. So. Reverse market strategy is the best way, and especially right now with what everything's going on. Like it, cool. So we got we got like ten minutes before they kick us out, and they're they're pretty adamant today that we mm. adhere to the time. So really quickly, I did want to let everybody know Bethany is going to be speaking in Bellevue when. Isn't it? Well, aren't you doing the REAPS business credit? Oh yes, I am. Oh yes, I'm doing a business credit. Um, so she's next gonna, week, I think. No, uh, two. Weeks, isn't it? <laughs> no, I think it's the I think it's the eleven. Okay, so there's a local real estate investor meetup called REAPS. I don't know if you've heard of it. Google it. But she's giving a talk on building your business credit, which could be helpful for a few of us in here. Uh, it's going to be up next in Wednesday. Bellevue. So, and then also. We really like dove into, I asked her how she's sourcing material, I asked her what kind of returns people are looking at, how she's finding markets, how we're analyzing what is a good market, how are we calculating median income, all of that stuff we went into on the podcast, so keep an eye out for that. I want to really leave the last couple minutes, if nobody has any more questions for Bethany, I would encourage you, please come connect with her, she's a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting. Something that I something I really love about this model is the creativity, the ability to like liquidate individual assets as opposed to like a vertical multifamily. It's very, very strategically yeah. creative, especially during these weird times. We have to force uh, a way to, I guess, have multiple exits and find liquidity in today's market. So, thank you again. While we wrap up, I would encourage you guys. This room is all about synergy. Please talk to people in this room when we wrap up. Go meet five new people. I'm telling you, you're gonna walk out of this room more powerful for having somebody else's phone number. There's so many awesome powerhouses in this room. I don't know, Trevor, can you raise your hand? Trevor just hosted a multifamily summit last weekend. It was incredible. It was incredible. It was incredible. The keynotes so we had, time. he had huge players in the game come and speak. He's gonna do it again next year, right? So talk to he's, Trevor. He's passed the crash. He's willing to say yes now. Talk to Trevor about multifamily. Talk to him about his deal he just got done. Talk, talk to him about his event. It was such a great event. This guy, this is my friend Chris. He owns a local fishing rod company and like other gear what, what, tell me about your company really quick fishing rods fishing rods <laughs> <laughs> um, look we got i mean he's just he's a cool dude he's got a local business you're a flipper right you she flips he's got a wholesale company we buy heavily houses dylan is incredible just closed a nine unit in seaside you've got executive rentals you guys just closed on an off-market deal that you sourced from like synergy with dylan and the zero to 100 tribe right um, Terry got there. He's a, he owns a uh, brokerage in Tacoma called Terry Wise and Associates. He does land development. 
Zane, what, what are you working on right now? I'm doing uh, my own version of house hacking, but with my lot. I'm building a detached building unit now. I love it. I have an RV lot that I've been renting, and it's actually covering about 35% of my mortgage. Wow, nice. nice. So I'm, I'm experimenting with that, and I've done a lot of education in the last year and a half with, within real estate, and I'm working two W-2s as a nurse. I love it. I love Whoa, it. Whoa, one's on that. You need two. I'm hustling. Yeah. You, we got a power couple in the back. We got a, a realtor and a, a construction background, and they're like looking for houses to flip and force appreciate. We got John, who's about to retire from the military with a ton of time. He's bird dogging. He's getting into deals. Caden is making three hours of outreach calls a day for off-market properties. We have so much potential in this room. Please talk to people. Talk to people.